Okay, so the last um, 20 minutes, 25 minutes. Uh, so we, we, we established that uh, a patentable invention um, has to be an invention with the meaning of, within the meaning of patent law. That means that it, it has to have a technical ink content, content and, uh, and we've talked about uh, you know, why an algorithm is not patentable and why the use of it in a technical context uh, to achieve a technical effect would be patentable. Um, it has to be new, it has to be non-obvious, um, and the determination of this depends on how we define the invention. Uh, and, and this determination, of course, is uh, not the same all over the world. Um, so you may well end up with patent rights in the US and not Europe, uh, and you know, each patent authority has a different way of looking at things. Um, oh. Okay, and <clears throat> as I say down here, technical solutions implemented in software are indeed patentable, provided they have a technical content. So um, we've learnt a little bit about what was what can be protected. Um, then the question is: Is it, is it worthwhile? <clears throat> uh, and. This is, uh, I, I, I'm not going to talk a lot about this here, but it is the sort of thing that anybody who's going to put money into what you're interested in doing will be thinking about. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's one thing as to whether it will be patentable, and of course the advantages of your invention are those which you will use to convince the patent authorities to grant you a patent. But the protecting it, spending all this money in patent protection only makes sense if uh, you know, it, it will, you know, you're going to be able to sell it. Uh, uh, does it have uh, the functionality that you want? Does it perform as you would expect? Uh, do the production costs of it make sense in terms of what you could sell it for? Uh, is it reliable? Will any, you know, will you get uh, such a, um, a poor uh, report on, you know, these technical uh, journals of, of evaluating products for sale? Is it such that your product gets such a lousy score from the public that no one will ever buy it again? Um, patent protection, is it worth, is it easy to detect someone's infringing it? So there's no point in, if, if, if your invention is something which is going on inside a factory, uh, you could as well swear all your staff to secrecy and carry out the method in secrecy. Um, there wouldn't be any need to tell anyone else. Uh, uh, then it's a question, is it easy for competitors to uh, identify your invention? I mean, uh, let's imagine you want to keep it secret or uh, could, could they you know, buy the product and then reverse engineer it? Um, even though you thought that the sort of the wonders of this item were somehow hidden, um, is is the improvement detectable by the product? Um, is the timing uh, right? Uh, is the market ready for it? Uh, what lifetime does it have? Uh, is it easy for competitors, as, as I say, to work around it? So these are, I mean, I won't. These are things that I'm sure you are thinking about. Uh, regularly with your, uh, in this course, but I, I just want to point out that a patent attorney ought to be asking you these sorts of questions before you launch into filing a patent application. Uh, <clears throat> now I am going to uh, launch into um, uh, this sheet of paper and the one before, and that's so that you go home with some idea about uh, patents, and forgive me if there are things that I say that you know already. Um, this uh, is the top half of the front page of a published patent application. Um, and uh, you will see that it says that this has been published under the aegis of the World Intellectual Property Organization. Uh, and you can see at the top it says it's an international application which has been published under this treaty. Um, this piece of paper 
uh, and uh, which uh, we've, some of you with your projects have looked for pra art and you have found uh, patent applications published and they have this sort of a number on them. Um, this, although it's under the aegis of the World Intellectual Property Organization and it says WO and other, the other applications you've seen things like uh, GB and CN, uh, the GB and the CN are, as I say, national applications and depending on the numbers at the end or the letters at the end, they may either be applications or they may, may be granted. Uh, for example, a European application starts as EP and then it has a number and then it's A1. A1 is an application. When it's granted, the last letters will be converted to B1. Uh, this document will never, ever, ever be a patent application. So there is no such thing as a world patent. It does not exist. Um, but So then uh, this document, however, and uh, this organization do something which is very important, and I will come back to that in a second. Okay. Yeah. You said it will never ever be which? A patent. So this is, uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is an application, and you can say, okay, this is an international application for a patent, but it will never result in a patent for the world. Okay, so now um, we will see down here something which says designated states. And that means that this application has been made on behalf of all these countries which are a member of this, who signed this treaty. And all these countries here have agreed that if you file a patent application under this organization, then in doing so, you have also asked for an application in all these countries that have signed this treaty. So it's, as it, as it were, in lieu of. So uh, you, when, when this is filed, you're saying, I am filing one application, which is this international application, and I'm doing it because I wish to have the possibility at some time in the future of having rights in one or all of these different countries. And uh, somewhere here, uh, there should be EP, which I can't see now, uh, which would be uh, a, an application for <coughs> the Euro uh, Europe, which would then cover all countries uh, in Europe. Okay, so let us then go uh, back and let me explain to you what actually happens. Uh, let us imagine that you go to... Uh, the tech trans office here and you say I've got this invention um, and uh, I think we should uh, I would like to see a patent application filed for that and the tech trans office will talk to you and eventually uh, they may decide that's a great idea um, they'll ask you to fill out an information dis uh, uh, an invention or innovation di invention disclosure form and then a patent attorney will be asked to come in and do a search and figure out whether they think possibly it might be patentable. And if they agree that that's possibly the case, then an application will be prepared. Now, um, uh, patent applications uh, have the oddity that um, they start off that you file something and it's not published for ages, not for one and a half years. And you don't even enter, you don't enter, you don't reach the stage of saying, okay, now I've decided that I really want to have patent protection in China. That you don't even think about until uh, 30 or 31 months from when you began. And then you could ask yourself, why on earth would you want to wait so long? So you, you have this idea, and um, you've got the patent attorney to write this all up. Uh, why wouldn't you want uh, this uh, patent application to be granted tomorrow? Um, I can give you one hint to this answer to this question, and that is that in many countries, when you 
uh, you have to make your decision about which countries in the world you want protection, uh, that you have to have your application translated. So if you'd like to have patent rights in China, you're going to have the patent application um, translated. So anybody have any suggestions about why would you think it advantageous that the patent application process is extremely slow? Yeah? You would uh, gain some years in the area before your patent run out? Uh, unfortunately, the clock starts here after 12 months. Yeah. Any other suggestions? Um, well, uh, if you can imagine, any of you, uh, with your, your projects that you're going to get going, uh, and you're going to go and you're going to persuade uh, the bank to put some money in, and you're going to have to have a factory to build this stuff, and you have to have someone to do it, and then you have to carry out uh, maybe additional sort of large-scale tests. That takes a lot of time, and it takes money. So you don't really want to spend a lot of money on patenting till you're sure that this is all going to go forward. And of course, uh, so long as you will have one application, then it's sort of cheap. But once you begin to say, OK, now I want to have protection in, now I've decided, you know, I definitely want to have patent protection in US, China, Japan, South Africa, whatever, each of the, ap the applications have to go out to all those individual countries, and you have to pay patent attorneys in all of those countries. Uh, you have to pay fees. It's horrific. So, so, so uh, a huge delay is a good idea. It simply f enables you to have time to figure out what you want to do. Uh, there is another aspect of why this should all take so long, and that is that uh, uh, there's two steps. Firstly is that I said you go to the TechTrans office and they say, okay, let's go ahead. So you file a, a first patent application which could be at the Danish Patent Office or it could be at the US Patent Office. And in that, you're going to uh, put in the patent claims, you're going to describe your invention, you're going to put some examples in. Uh, and the, the, hopefully, uh, you actually know in advance why does this invention work and what do I have to make it work. The only thing you've not quite done is all the tests. So you, you fill out the application and uh, you, you know, someone drafts the claim, you describe it, you put in the test you've done, and you file it. And that document effectively says, this is the problem, this is the solution, these are the components that are needed. End of story. The only thing that you're missing is probably all of those tests. So the trick is that in this 12 months, uh, the whole thing is t kept totally secret. You have put in your application, you have established a date for your invention. The day it arrives at the patent office electronically is fixed as the date of your invention. So that in order to assess whether it's novel and inventive, you are saying, what did people know the day before and backwards, and nothing forwards. So that is, fixes the date. So of course, the earlier you file your application, the less prior art that is considered. If you wait uh, more and more time, then of course your competitors are out there publishing and filing. So you, it, the first to file is sort of what it's all about. But the, then the problem is, have you done all the experiments? So in these 12 months, you, you, you do the experiments. And here you've had your idea, you reckon you've found the solution, you spend the year doing tests. Uh, at the end of the year, you have, uh, you've done um, four fantastic tests. You've confirmed that, that the that the invention you have, all the components needed to solve it, do actually work. So you put, you take your original text and you dump in all these nice examples. So this first document, which is filed in any country, I mean, well, wherever you, you, you could do it, as I say, in the US or in Denmark or Europe or Sweden, there are a number of places you can do it. Uh, you could you file it. At the end of 12 months, the, the, the weeks before, you add all these additional uh, uh, examples. Uh, and then on the, this date here, which is the priority year, the 12 months, then you file the application, which looks like this. Uh, it has this on the front page. Uh, the only difference, I, as I say, it could be a complete copy of the earlier one. Um, and <clears throat> But you might have added the examples. And here you can see... Uh, you know, who were the inventors and who was the patent attorney, what company did they work for, 
and uh, all the rest of it. Okay, so 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 say this this application which I've just shown you the picture of is filed on this day, and you have now you have a long period uh, from from 12 months to 30 31 months. It depends on which country, and this period is valuable for uh, two reasons. First, I've told you it's uh, a time where you can begin to do biggest scale tests. You can interest uh, investors. You can think about, you know, uh, th there's a difference between lab scale tests and commercial tests, prototypes, you know, something bigger and, uh, you know, wider scale testing which will convince someone to build a factory. Or equally, it could be that you're never going to make this yourself and you're going to go out and approach all sorts of licensees. That takes time. So, um, but the other very important part about this is that the, uh, the, the authorities here, these guys, they don't just, you know, sit there and publish stuff. Uh, they actually examine your invention. And the people who do the examination, uh, let me think about this. I don't think it says here. But anyway, the, the country or the place where this will be examined, there are various places in the world who, who, who can examine whether this is patentable. It could be the European Patent Office, it could be the US Patent Office, China, China. there are a number of countries who can do this. Anyway, <clears throat> what they will do is that at 18 months, they will, the, uh, I mean, obviously you pay a fee for this, uh, the examiners sitting, for example, at the European Patent Office or the US, on behalf of this, uh, this uh, WIPO organization, they will do a professional search of the patent literature and the published literature, and they will find out what was known in the literature. And they will send you a report saying, these are all the documents that we think, publications which are very close to your invention, identical to or near to. And they will not only produce a spread of all the relevant patent literature, but they will also give you an opinion. And they will say to you, well, uh, we think that uh, claim number one is not novel, um, and we don't need to think it's, whether it's inventive if it's not novel, uh, but we actually think claim number three, where you've added you know, that the rotor has to be of made of aluminium, uh, and, and it has these fantastic effects of, of speed or whatever, uh, we think that's uh, both novel and inventive, and they will give you reasons for finding that. And, and then, uh, hopefully, uh, at about this date here, you will get an international preliminary opinion on patentability. In between, you have the possibility of amending your patent claims, and the dream scenario is you exit here with a report from WIPO saying claims 1 to... 18 are novel and inventive and have industrial application. At that moment, you can go to your board of directors, your bank, uh, your licensee, and say, look, this has a reasonable expectation of being patentable. Put your money into it. It's a great business. Um, <clears throat> and then, uh, in, if, if, if they're convinced, then at either 30 or 31 months, then you uh, make the decision of Yes, I applied for the possibility of patent protection in various countries. Now I have decided I have money enough to pay for Europe and the US. In which case, I instruct uh, my attorney to take the text here, this exact text, and file it uh, with the relevant patent authorities. Um, I should say that... Um, the text of this application, which was filed here, can never be changed except for uh, it, the, the patent claims in it and the text can be narrowed. Uh, you are allowed to make claims based on what you said, but you cannot ever, ever add anything new. So everything has to be here at the beginning. The only possibility is that uh, as it were, the invention and the solution to the problem has to be there. If at some point 
your, uh, for example, the European Patent Office says, oh, you know, we really think one of the examples doesn't really work. We're, we don't think you've really shown that. Then you could uh, go off and do some lab experiments and, and send them in. But you are stuck with the text here. And if you find out later that actually this invention doesn't work because we've left out one essential bit, too bad. And if you've already published it, then, you know, then you're in a really bad way. So that's why that from here to the day that it's published, this period, hopefully you keep everything super secret. And that's why, for example, Kant Skint students, uh, you know, when they defend their speciala, have to be particularly careful that their presentation is held within, you know, uh, confidential and that their thesis is then not put in the library and it's not put on a shelf anywhere officially. Um, or that pages are blacked out. I've had students who had you know, parts of their thesis blacked out. Um, so that's a possible solution to the problem. Uh, and uh, the expenses, uh, I can tell you that a, uh, a mechanical patent application to be drafted by an attorney is going to cost, a, including filing fees, is about... Uh, 40,000 krona, and for a biotech application will be, including fees, will be closer to 80,000. And the, the filing this international application, the fees for that will be about 30,000 krona, just filing fees. Um, uh, the, and the filing fees include the fact that, that they're, of course, going to do some examination here. Um, so it's... it's uh, uh, we're talking about something which is going to cost between two and ten million, depending on how many countries you're going to go after. So, yeah. Sometimes in American produced products, you see a patent pimpling symbol on the product. When in the process, where is it in the process are the patent then? Uh, well, anywhere um, up until here. So the pending is this whole period, and, and this period could be, oh, it would be, it'd be a really long time. I mean, you can have patent applications that are granted, not even granted at the end of the 20 years. It's not very common these days. The, the, actually, the USPTO is actually obliged to uh, take no more than three years to grant a patent. So, uh, <coughs> Do we have any uh, further questions? Um, and we'll uh, I've heard this is possible that you can extend your initial you know, 12 month if you will, like file for extension of your like application or I don't know what it's called. Um, no. no, it's it's it's. Uh, it, I mean, it's it, quite fixed that date. Right. Um, I mean, it, it, one thing that can happen is that um, you can file an application where you file an application to a, a particular product that you've described. And then you might also have a, a method. And it's sometimes the examiners may say, well, the method, uh, the method of using is so different from the product itself. I mean, that it's, it has a different sort of scope that actually really it's two inventions. And then they may force you to they'll grant you a first application for the product and then they will force you to, to file what they call a divisional, which is a sort of a copy of the, the first one but with a new set of claims to the method. And then you, you, you pay for that to be granted. But then you end up with two applications for the sort of same idea uh, and, and you have to pay two sets of fees. Um, okay. and, and the term is exactly the same. It's 20 years from here. Okay, Verena, thank you very much for uh, imparting your wisdom on us. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, thank you for all your time and effort put into the uh, student projects as well. I will send you an email about uh, the two projects that were on the list, which I haven't talked about. I will send an email to the group, and if they would like to come and have lunch with them next sort of two weeks with me um, and go through their projects, they're fine. And if, if you 
too busy, that's also fine. Is that okay? And, and, and I, I hope you um, accept that it was better to do each project with the time it takes and not try and rush through all of them at once. So. Okay, lunchtime.